over Canada, and I'm moderating this first session, and actually the next one as well. I'm, I'm playing the role of Steve Collins, because he's not here yet for this first one. And uh, I, I feel like I might have to stall for a few seconds. Is that true, Manoj? A few seconds. Okay. So um, this is uh, Manoj Srinivasanan. Uh, he's uh, giving the first long talk of today. It's going to be amazing. And hopefully a little bit different than um, what he gave in Vancouver a few months ago. Possible? <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so you might be wondering, is it OK if you have a question during Manoj's talk, whether or not you can ask it? And the answer is, yeah. Throw up your hand. And especially if it's one you think would benefit everybody in order to understand um, something that Manoj might have gone over too quickly. And that applies throughout the conference. And if it becomes too many questions, I might step in and just ask you to hold them to the end. And then, um, and then at the end, we'll hopefully have a long, robust question period. I think most of us feel like the best part of dynamic walking is these robust discussions that happen at the end of talks. And we want to really value that period of time and not, not cut it short. And for that reason also, we'll make sure that the speakers stick to their timeline and so they don't, have, they don't stop right when it's time to go to the next, the next talk. So, and uh, so there'll be lots of time for discussion, especially during this talk. Are you ready? This is Manoj. Thanks, Max. Uh, can everyone hear me in the back? Perfect. Thank you. OK, so here are a few short talks. Uh, let me jump right in. OK, just before I give all these short talks, I want to get to the main conclusion first. It's Laurel. <laughs> OK. So a couple of years ago, we did this experiment. This is people standing on a treadmill. And the treadmill slowly moves forward and then suddenly stops. And the subject does not know when the treadmill will stop and at what speed the treadmill will stop. And the subject is supposed to recover. In other words, not fall down. That's the goal. Okay. And uh, variants of this experiment have been done, uh, I don't know, for the last 30, 40 years, various perturbation experiments for standing balance, where you pull a person and see how they respond. And uh, the classic sort of uh, uh, moral that people have gotten from these perturbation experiments is that for small perturbations, you can recover without stepping. And then for large perturbations, you have to step. Okay? So this is kind of a variant on that theme. Uh, in particular, we want to understand uh, the stepping behavior from an energy optimality perspective. Uh, we used two simple models, uh, maybe one more complicated than the other. Uh, and we said, given a perturbation, what is the energy optimal way for it to recover? Uh, other people have done similar calculations, like Chris uh, in the back over the years. Uh, and, but these optimization calculations suggest that there are three regimes. Small perturbations, where no stepping is optimal. Medium perturbations, where a no stepping recovery is possible. In other words, you can recover without stepping. But if you step, you can actually recover with lower energy cost. And then for really large perturbations, you have to step. There is no way of recovering without stepping. Okay. So it's three different regimes. Uh, and the medium perturbations are perhaps the most interesting thing. Uh, so what do people do? Uh, this is the stepping response of people to perturbations. On the y-axis is a step length. On the x-axis is the perturbation size, which is some non-dimensionalized forward velocity of the treadmill when it stopped. And you note it was like a I don't know, thousand points or something for eight subjects. Uh, and you notice that for small perturbations, the step length is basically zero. Uh, and for large enough perturbations, you always step. Uh, and for medium perturbations, you sometimes step and sometimes don't. Okay? Uh, or some people step, some people don't. This is like pulled, pulled over all subjects, but most subjects display the behavior that uh, they sometimes step, sometimes don't. That, that you have dots on the bottom of the third quadrant means your model is wrong, right? Yeah, in some way. Absolutely. Right. Uh, it's not, yeah, people are, people are more variable than our model predicts. Sure. 
Can people see the dot? The invisible dot? <laughs> okay. What do I press? There you go. Okay. I'm glad it wasn't a red laser. Uh, the, the Andy asked if the fact that we have dots out here suggests that uh, the conceptual model or the statement that I made is not quite right, which is that beyond a particular th threshold, people always step. Uh, that's not quite right, of course. Uh, people are weird. Uh, OK, so that's the response to uh, these perturbation experiments. Um, OK, so and then what we did, because our uh, model predicted that there is this intermediate regime where uh, stepping, uh, recovering without stepping is possible but not optimal, we asked people, we did the same experiment, but then asked people to try their best to not step, if at all possible. Okay? So then what happens is uh, the, uh, well, you notice basically that there are more dots here. In other words, people use stepping more often here than here which makes sense, at least it is clear that uh, for perturbations that they sort of mostly previously stepped for, they're not stepping as much. Uh, so in other words, at least this suggests, well, okay, so those bands are actually, uh, when people are not constrained, people stepped about 50% of the time, and uh, when they were asked to not step, they uh, stepped for less than 20% of the time. So they were certainly had the capability to not step and still recover. Uh, in this regime. Again, it's not a precise deterministic thing, just a lot of variability. Okay, so that's the moral of the story, and the very simple model makes these predictions about stepping, when you should step and when you should not. Uh, it's, the fit is not great, but that's what it is. Uh, okay, here's the conclusion. Uh, people step often even when they can recover without stepping, perhaps because uh, they can recover with le less effort by stepping. That's the end of that story. Slack question that's relevant to this part of the presentation. Okay. Is there any correlation between not stepping and foot length? We did not check that. Uh, although um, all these plots that I showed were non dimensional, uh, and I guess the variability sort of slightly reduced with uh, non dimensionalization of things. So I guess the answer is perhaps yes, yeah. Uh, come back to standing still. What? Come, uh, do not fall down. Uh, uh, and so very vague instructions, right? So come back to standing still was the instruction, right? Do something. So we, we didn't ask them to step or not or anything like that. We, we didn't say anything about stepping. Okay? So the vague suggestion is that maybe even for these simple tasks, uh, things like effort matter. And, and, and I'm sure this is intuitive to you. Uh, I'm sure you, you can sort of feel like for some perturbations you can do wild things and recover, but it might just be very simple to step and recover. Right. Okay, so some of you may have heard the story, but there's a variant on this theme. Um, so if you ask people to walk, short distances versus long distances, uh, which we did. Uh, the speed, the average speed and the steady state pe speed people pick uh, are systematically different, right? So for long distances, uh, people walk faster. For short distances, people walk slower. Why is this? Uh, it may be because there's a cost for changing speeds. Uh, Nidhi here uh, characterized the cause of changing speeds during walking by having people walk back and forth on a treadmill. In other words, apply a fluctuating uh, velocity on top of a constant velocity, and then we did a bunch of such fluctuations, then figured out at least approximately some regression relation that uh, fit the, the additional cost of changing speeds. Then what if there is a cost for changing speeds? Uh, if there's a cost for changing speeds, that cost dominates really short bouts of walking because uh, you have to go from rest, change speed, walk, stop. So going from rest to some speed and then back to rest, that's a big part of walking cost. But if there's long distance, 
no cost of walking completely dominates. So if the cost of walking completely dominates your cost, there's some optimal speed of walking, which, is, which has been characterized for, I don't know, 100 years or something. Uh, but then if you add to it this cost of going from zero to some v and then back to zero, you predict that for shorter distances, because this cost of changing speeds dominates, the way to minimize that cost is to go at a uh, lower average velocity or lower steady state velocity. So that's the qualitative prediction, and that's what people do. Uh, Nidhi uh, tested the same uh, uh, relationships for uh, unilateral amputees, uh, and if they, of course, uh, show the same relation with systematically lower speeds, uh, which is mostly captured by the fact that uh, their walking and the steady state walking energy cost is 20-30% uh, higher than normal walking, than uh, uh, non-IPT walking costs. And that's the end of that talk. Yes? Single limb or double? This is a unilateral, single limb, yeah. Okay. Uh, single limb abounding amputees. Okay. Uh, this is the third little talk. Um, people are behaviorally non-holonomic. What do I mean by that? Uh, they behave as if they have certain velocity degrees of freedom not available to them. Okay? So I like to say people are like, walking people are like cars or people on skates. Uh, what do I sort of explain a little bit more? Let's say you want to walk sideways or you want to move sideways and you're facing forward, what do you do? Well, if you just want to walk a short distance, like right there, I'm going to just take a step this way. But if I want to take, uh, walk a long distance, I wouldn't walk like this all the way, <laughs> right? Uh, what you would do is turn and walk forward, right? So it's as if you're not really using the sideways degree of freedom. Right, so that's what I mean by you don't use certain degrees of freedom. Similarly, uh, if you want to walk backward, or well, you want to get there, if, if it's a short distance, I would just step backward, but if it's a long distance, I would turn, walk forward. Right? More generally, when we walk, uh, we face the direction in which we are moving. Right? Uh, it's as if this rotational degree of freedom is coupled to uh, this, this sort of velocity direction. Even though we don't have to do that, we could walk like this in a diagonal facing forward, right? So that we, we're capable of doing that, but we don't do it. Why? Uh, we can give an energetic account of it. Uh, sideways walking, as Matt, somewhere in the audience, characterized a few years ago, costs three times as much as forward walking per unit length, OK? Uh, and then Jeff, who's not in the room, uh, characterized the cost of turning by making people walking in circles, and that has a cost. Uh, over and above the cost of walking forward, so you can characterize the walk of turning, uh, and, then, uh, and then the special case of that is the cost of turning in place. Uh, anyway, those, all those things have a cost, and there's an empirical relationship we got from data. Um, you can sort of put these things together for at least the simple experiment that I suggested, uh, and, and, and sort of make a prediction. What should you do if you have to go sideways a certain distance? Should you turn and walk forward, or should you just step sideways? And sort of compare the two costs, we're using these two components. And uh, you predict that if you just have to move sideways for about 0.751 meters, you just step sideways. Uh, but if you want to go any longer, you uh, have to turn and walk forward. That's a prediction. We haven't done the actual behavioral experiment yet. Maybe we'll do it. OK, that's the end of that talk. Yes? That, that's, that's another, absolutely. Uh, Pranav said, maybe you just want to see where you want to go. Uh, that's certainly a possibility. But you can s see like this. But maybe, maybe you don't get quite the same uh, uh, range of vision. Um, yeah. And then maybe there's an energy cost for keeping your head turned as well. OK? Uh, you can take that. Um, Cost of turning, uh, which, which we got by making people walk in circles for three hours, uh, uh, and, and use that cost to make other behavioral predictions. Um, one such is if you ask people to walk in a circle at whatever speed that they prefer, uh, you can predict that people walking in smaller circles would prefer to go a little bit slower. People walking in larger circles would prefer to go a little bit faster. 
and people walking in straight lines would have uh, the highest uh, tangential velocity. Uh, so in other words, uh, that is that top uh, left plot there, which is a circle radius on the x-axis, uh, preferred speed on the y-axis, and, and uh, the prediction is uh, the blue band, uh, and, and, and uh, the uh, box plots are uh, what people actually did. And they seem to lie reasonably on top of each other. Right? So people do the same thing, and that's what the model predicts. Um, other people have done other experiments, uh, sort of path planning experiments, where this is top view of a path planning experiment where uh, you're asked to go through a doorway and then go through another doorway. Uh, so in other words, you're given the initial position and the initial tangent, the final position and the final tangent. And what do you do? Uh, people take these sort of smooth paths uh, as opposed to going straight, making a sharp turn, going straight, and so on. Uh, the cost of turning that we characterized uh, penalizes these sharp turns uh, so that uh, when you optimize uh, the simple cost, you do get these somewhat smooth. Not exactly as, as smooth as the other one, but at least somewhat smooth. At least sharp turns are not preferred. Uh, other experiments that other people have done uh, involved uh, velocity preference on uh, shapes of non-constant curvature uh, where uh, you walk in an ellipse, uh, people naturally uh, walk a little bit faster uh, along the uh, uh, smaller curvature, uh, smaller curvature, straighter path, straighter part of the curve, and the people uh, uh, slow down when the curve is tighter. And uh, the, the, these brown wiggles are the experimental data from their paper, and uh, the blue is the model, uh, which predicts the same kind of trends. I see. Is it from the future? For which one? This thing? Uh, the instruction was, I think, um, I think they were asked to uh, do a fixed number of laps around the circle. And we uh, uh, average the speed over the last so many laps. Fixed distance. There may be, uh, but how would you? I, 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 the question is, um, my, my question to repeat uh, uh, is whether there might be a psychological component. Uh, maybe I mean, I'm sure all of these have psychological components potentially. Uh, it's unclear to me how exactly for, uh, to make predictions for, uh, like based on those psychological. I don't know what the principles are, I suppose. So I guess we stick to the simple principles that we know a little bit about and then make predictions. And maybe there are other factors that we are missing out on. Uh, yeah. So, um, is this linked to the so-called Kiefer model? Sorry. So, is is this uh, patterns for the velocity linked to the uh, Kiefer model, or what is it like? The basically the velocity um, power is proportional, or a oh, two-thirds power law. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, in this, uh, I, I think other, uh, people have written papers fitting this data to the two-thirds power law. Uh, my sense is that there's not a huge range of velocities here. So if you're fitting a power law, it's like you can fit a lot of things uh, pretty well. Uh, that's my sense. Yeah. It, it, like power laws are most appropriate when there's a huge range, orders of magnitude differences in the velocities. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, that. Oh. Someone. Uh, Chris, uh, yeah, you. Uh, the cost function, well, let's see. Uh, it is uh, the integral of uh, this metabolic rate uh, plus uh, a cost for changing speeds as well. This is basically the cost. So I didn't explain this formula. Uh, this uh, empirical relationship was obtained by making people walking in circles with different tangential velocities and different radii. So we have metabolic rate as a function of tangential velocity and radius. And then, so that's V is tangential velocity, R is radius, omega is V over R. Uh, 
and then for any path, uh, you can associate with the path instantaneously, instantaneous curvature and the instantaneous tangential velocity. So this quantity is well defined, uh, and you integrate that quantity. Yes, Chris. We've not thought about, I mean, we've not done experiments to test those hypotheses, I would say. Uh, but I would imagine it has to be, it has to have some finite time horizon. That would be my guess. But it still could be smooth with it, finite time horizon. Absolutely, I agree, yeah. I, we don't have, I don't know if anyone has any evidence for this, but. So What do you mean by chunky? That they're, they're planned in sort of phases? If you want to find segments, you can find segments. For example, with our with eyes, we talk about six Right. Like with our movements, you have dips in the tangential velocity. That's right. Uh, a lot of people yeah. argue that our movements are planned in short segments. Well, they argue that. Have they provided evidence for that, do you think? Like, in terms of, you can find these segments. But what of that is an answer to some other question that we've not asked? It is a philosophical question. Okay. I don't have an empirical answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going uh, yeah. to use you as an example. Whenever. Yeah. So, on, people can hear me? There we go. Um, so this is a 30-minute se like, section for a 20-minute talk and then 10 minutes of questions. And because there's so many good questions, we're going to let Manoj go on for, for let's say, a four more minutes of your talk. Okay. And then we'll have six minutes of questions, dedicated to questions at the end. Yeah? Sounds good. Okay. So you, everyone's doing perfect. That's really great. All right. <laughs> Keep it up. Uh, have I addressed? I don't know. I, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> were, there, were there other hands raised? Uh, wait, yeah. Well, I guess th that is certainly true, but uh, our movements are discrete, but a walk from here to here is also discrete. Could be thought of as an analog of an R movement. It's, it's like reaching with your legs, moving your whole body. Uh, okay, so this is like another short talk for, for uh, the Kennedy's work, um, which is uh, sort of closely parallels uh, Shire Evans' work. Uh, somewhere in the audience. Um, so, let's see. Oops, the video doesn't play. Yeah, so we collected uh, running data, steady state running data, and there's a lot of step to step variability in the running data. Uh, this is uh, four out speed, sideways speed at uh, apex for hundreds of steps. It's a cloud of points and means subtracted. <coughs> Uh, and everything varies step to step. Uh, this is well known. And then you can uh, construct sort of relationships between uh, what the body state is at, say, flight apex, and then what, where you place your feet at the next step, or uh, what you do over the next step. In other words, what impulses do your legs apply against the ground? Uh, and we find that the relationships uh, that we get are relatively simple. Uh, if we use uh, center of mass uh, state uh, with relatively high R square values, uh, I guess uh, around anywhere between 0 0.3 and uh, 0 0.5 or 0 0.6. Uh, but maybe most interestingly, uh, they seem to be somewhat decoupled. In other words, the sideways impulse is mainly related to the sideways velocity. The fore aft impulse is mainly related to the fore aft velocity. Uh, the sideways foot placement. Uh, is mainly related to the sideways velocity. In other words, you step in the direction of where you are, in the direction you're perturbed, so to speak. Uh, and the, but the fore-aft foot placement, in other words, where you place your foot relative to the body, 
is not only dependent on the 4F velocity perturbation, but also uh, the Z perturbation, uh, suggesting that if you're landing from a little bit higher, you would land with a steeper leg, okay? uh, which has been uh, found in other uh, experiments and uh, data, I suppose. That's right, sorry. This is, I think, for one of the two stances, left stance or right stance or something like that. You're absolutely right. OK, so uh, these regression relationships uh, are, I think, uh, for one of the two legs. Like, I think it might be the left leg. Uh, for the right leg as well. So these, reg these relationships have uh, what you would call mirror symmetry. Uh, any gain, I'm going to call this gain, any gain that couples forward and forward, sideways and sideways, or uh, vertical and vertical, uh, well, they are just what they are. Uh, any gain, any cr sort of cross-coupling gain uh, has a mirror symmetry in that uh, they're symmetric about the sagittal plane, which means anything that couples sideways and forward or vertical and forward will switch signs depending on whether you're looking at the left leg or the right leg. Okay. Uh, and that can be accounted for by this absolute value sign that uh, uh, Jerry suggested here. Okay, that's the end of that. Okay, I, I ran out of time. Okay. Okay. Thanks for questions. Is this on? Cool. So this thing's really cool. It's called a throw box. You can talk into it, and then if you throw it to someone, it doesn't make a whole bunch of noise like a normal mic. Testing, testing. So we're going to toss that around for questions. Okay, and uh, um, just for future, uh, Jonathan's back there with the question, looks like. For future speakers and moderators, um, let's let the moderator choose who asks the questions so the speaker can focus on the answers to the questions. And so Jonathan, please go first. Uh, so my question here is about basis functions. You've chosen vertical, horizontal, and forward, backwards. Um, is that the right, right basis function or does it matter? Should you be choosing leg length and leg angle? Would you find different correlations? Uh, we might, yeah. So I would say it's unclear how to completely systematically, I mean, there's the world of controllers is infinite dimensional. I mean, it's like infinite dimensional doesn't even start to describe it, right? So if you're trying to characterize the structure of the human walking or running controller, all we can do is take guesses and see how those guesses play out in terms of describing the data. So I would say this is a start. Uh, and then other, uh, there may be other equivalent ways of describing uh, that does as well. Uh, there may be uh, maybe slightly better ways of describing it. Uh, yeah. I would say, yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. But it's a good question, yeah. It's an open question, I would say. I'm going to throw, throw it here. hit people. Heads up. <laughs> Right here? To there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a little slow. I'm still thinking about the first short talk. Perfect. Um, so you mentioned that uh, people uh, were not instructed, uh, were not told when the treadmill will stop. But were they instructed to not swing their arms also? Because I saw the video. Uh, That's where right. Yeah, so they were all asked to uh, uh, tie their hands just to uh, walk. It's just another variable. Uh, right. to remove. Yeah. But then I would imagine that uh, swinging arms forward or backward, I think, would help stabilize also at a certain stop, right. right? Absolutely, yeah. So okay. uh, swinging arms certainly will help, help, help you uh, increase the range of perturbations for which you can recover without stepping. Right, okay. I completely agree with okay. that. Thanks. We just wanted to take out that degree of freedom. Okay. Yeah. There's a question out there. It works. So the question that I have is that most of your studies, you use uh, models to fit some data. Right? Um, so, so just building a model that can fit some data, does it really say something about your original hypothesis? Or based on your original hypothesis, you try to attack it, I don't say that we need to see that's really that. Because you can potentially fit data to different models. 
So I would say not, almost nothing that I said had the flavor of fitting, uh, except uh, perhaps uh, this, this last thing. Right? So everything else is uh, no fitting. Uh, we just make a model, and it makes predictions. That's that. Yeah. In your, in your first talk, how big is that right-hand region if you go all the way to the next region where you can't recover? Put up that slide. Say that again. The, the right, go back to slide. Say. Take that right region and go as far as uh, falling. Yeah. So they can't recover at all. What, how big is that last right region compared to the other? For humans? Region? For humans. Uh, I don't know. When, 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 for what perturbations do people fall, period? Well, but, but I have a point, which is I think the first two regions. I mean, the, the left region doesn't matter if you're worried about not falling down. Of course, yeah. So, but, but you don't see that on that plot because you didn't show the whole left region. That, that the left region is really small, you don't see. But so how big is this for scale? Well, I mean, people fall down for all kinds of reasons. Do you want to just repeat the question? Okay. So, so Andy wants to compare. Uh, let's this uh, leftmost region, where people can recover without stepping, and it's optimal without stepping, perhaps, uh, to this region, where they can recover with stepping, and they don't fall down. And he says, this region is probably very large compared to this region. Uh, so perhaps this region doesn't matter, quote unquote. I don't know what you, don't, what you mean by doesn't matter, because. If you're worried about not falling down. That's fine, yeah. That's what I mean by that. Okay. Um, I, I guess I'll leave it at that. Yeah. I mean, I don't have. Yeah, I agree. It's much smaller. Uh, but in, in a sense, um, like all the perturbations that we experience in daily life are in that region, right? So in that sense, like it depends on how you count. So I just wonder how big is it? What's the I don't know. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So uh, there's one question back there. That we'll Oh, who's speaking? Do you want to raise your hand so I can? Yeah. We have not done that experiment. I, I just illustrated it as a thought experiment. Yeah, yeah. That's the prediction, but we have not done the behavioral experiment yet. Yeah. So that person sitting in this chair, near this chair, isn't actually a person. They're a bot that is just repeating questions chosen from Slack. So I'm now going to call on the questioner from Slack. Uh, yes, sir. Check one, two. <clears throat> I've got I've got two questions from Slack based on on upvotes. Uh, the first one I want to ask is: Do infants show similar patterns in walking direction and paths? Or, uh, Walking direction and path and speed. Perhaps they are less governed by energy optimality and more so by stability and exploration. Uh, good question. I don't know the answer to that question off the top of my head. The person that you who would know would be uh, there's a person called Karen Adolf who studies infant walking trajectories, uh, and that's been sort of uh, extensively sort of. Uh, a huge database of infant walking trajectories. I do not know if they have a similar sort of curvature versus speed relationship. Uh, I don't know what's been characterized. Yeah, off the top of my head. Good question. I've got one more slack question. Uh, do people steer like a bicycle, leaning into curves to keep balance only for running or also for walking? In other words, do people use footstep planning for sideways balance or leaning? Yes. <laughs> people use footstep planning. For sideways balance. Uh, Andy, do you want to take this? <laughs> go, go ahead. Go ahead. This is a bicycle expert here. First of all, I, like, yes, people are uh, people are like bicycles, and um, uh, and cars and skates, especially like bicycles. <laughs> And uh, I don't understand the question in terms of what's physics and what's behavior. Right. So, so I mean, physics constrains that if you're going sideways, you, if you're turning sideways, you have to lean sideways. So. Yes, but if you jump with your bicycle so you can see the ground. 
you still have to lean sideways. You can move the contact point without moving the center of mass. That's not correct. <laughs> Well, if, if, you're, if, if you think of the simple model of a point mass and a, at a foot contact, in order to jump sideways, you have to get a sideways force from the leg, and, and for that to happen, the leg has to be tipped. So that jumping sideways depends on leaning before the jump. So I'm going to try again. You've got two feet. One of them still on the ground. You can apply forces to the ground. Wow. <laughs> that, uh, whoa. <laughs> that allows you to move your other foot. Yeah, but that, so what, then the question is, what does leaning mean? So the meaning of leaning has to do with the, the effective point of contact. It doesn't because, mean anything. Okay, well, <laughs> nor does my answer. All right. What Art is saying is that they place their feet in the direction of uh, where their push off needs to be so that they can apply the push off sort of, no, no. no? This is about steering, so if you're a bicycle, you're going to steer into the turn, or meaning rotate okay, okay. in all directions within the front wheel of, uh, into the turn. And John Rula showed that people also show a slight correlation where they're going to put their, place the foot to the side more, they also steer that foot slightly to explicitly turn. I see. Different experiment. Okay, so, uh, while, so one of the, one of the jobs, important jobs of monitoring thing is if they can do it, and I might not be doing it very well, is to identify things that maybe aren't being said. And I think Art has been seething over here about his question of, from Noj about what the instructions were and was not happy with the answer. Is that uh, true? Uh, yeah, no And what about the use of... Oh, actually, Cost, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, uh -huh. one thing that could, could be added is Max did a cool psychology study. N equals one? Yeah. Do you want to tell people? I was thinking, though, you would tell people about <laughs> <laughs> how um, uh, cost, your beef with the cost of transport and for preferred walking speeds. And you didn't have, there's like this whole like five minute rant that <laughs> some of us have been exposed to that maybe you want to describe. No, I don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, it's a long rant about how preferred walking speed is garbage. Uh, but uh, Max, maybe you can talk about the psychology thing? Yeah, uh, OK. <laughs> you know this? I, I know this. Should I, should I say it? Yeah, sure. I think Max's N of 1 experiment yeah. was he had people walk maybe a certain distance or for a certain amount of time or something like that. Yeah, so Three different distances, three times. I'll do it. So okay, go for it. it, 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 it I think what's interesting about this is more the experimental design, because if n equals one, we really don't know the answer. But it was, uh, let's have people walk for um, 100 meters, a kilometer, or 10 kilometers, and we tell them that's what they're doing. Uh, um, or for one minute, 10 minutes, or 100 minutes, and we'll tell them it's a fixed time. And then we ask the question, you know, like if, you're, if you have to walk a fixed time, it doesn't really matter how fast you walk, right? And, uh, um, and the energetically rational thing to do would be to walk as slow as you could, yes. right? And if it's for a fixed distance, then you'd wanna, cho you'd, you'd wanna choose a speed, if, if you're behaving energetically rationally, you'd like to choose a speed that minimizes the energy for that distance. And you sort of see that, that pattern came out, that the people walked slower when it was fixed time, but they didn't discover like, that they could not walk, <laughs> right? That wasn't, because that, that, that you know, would have been an allowable solution. And actually, my favorite part of that experiment was we also, for the last one, it was a fixed time constraint. And, but the grad student pretended to take a phone call for me where I needed the equipment back immediately. And so they had to rush through this last one. But it was 10 minutes, so like, there's nothing they could rush through. And the question was whether or not they walked faster based upon these, like, this, uh, you know, this, this, the idea that they were rushed. And, and again, n, n equals one, and they did. But, um, uh, so, so we did uh, a related experiment recently at n equals 15. Uh, That's a little better. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, it's, we, we first measure the so-called preferred speed with no instruct very, very little instructions. We measure the preferred speed. And then we give them a stopwatch, which counts down time. But then we give them more time than it would take for them to walk at the preferred speed so that they could potentially walk at exactly the preferred speed or walk slower, et cetera. Uh, they, uh, 
they could walk slower, I guess. But everyone ends up walking a little bit faster than preferred speed with time pressure, even if they could walk at preferred speed and complete the task. So just giving them a stopwatch makes them arrive early. Okay, uh, I just got the nod. That's totally Jerry's fault. He needs to cut it off so you guys can go get some coffee. So let's thank Manoj. So one schedule says there's no coffee break and the other one says there is. Rest assured there is. So we'll meet back here. If you could be quick, we'll meet back here. Try and be on time at 10.05. Uh,